All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Damascus family. My name is Reverend Chipo Johnson, and I will be leading our Bible study this evening. I am just going to do a quick check to make sure that we are definitely online because I'm doing this by myself. So give me one second while I check Facebook. If you're joining us this evening, I invite you to get your Bibles and to turn to Ezra. And we're going to look at Ezra chapter 1. And so let us pray before we get started. All right. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this evening. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that you are God who is faithful, that you are God who gives us a word, who gives us promises to stand on, and that you are true to that word, that you are God whose word never fails, and that we can trust in you and believe in you no matter what situation we are in. We ask, Lord, that as we go through this time of Bible study together, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would bless us in our areas of need, and that you would bring comfort where we need to be comforted and that you would challenge us and call us higher in those areas where we need to rise up to be more like you. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. All right. And so I'm going to read from Ezra chapter one. I'm going to read from verses one up to verse six. And it reads as follows. And I'm reading from the Common English Bible. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia's rule, to fulfill the Lord's word spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Persia's King Cyrus. The king issued a proclamation throughout his kingdom. It was also in writing that stated, Persia's King Cyrus says this, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has commanded me to build him a house of Jerusalem in Judah. If there are any of you who are from his people, may their God be with them. They may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And as for all those who remain in the various places where they are living, let the people of those places supply them with silver and gold and with goods and livestock, together with spontaneous gifts for God's house in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up, got ready to go up and build God's house in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them with silver equipment, with gold, with goods, livestock and valuable gifts, in addition to all that was freely offered. And the word of the Lord is blessed. And again, for those of you who are just joining us this evening, our Bible study is entitled Unhindered and Unafraid. And we are in the book of Ezra. You can also write an alternative title if that is something that you're interested in. You can call it Who is Hindering You or Who is Hindering Who, right? So just to give a recap or like a brief overview um, about the book of Ezra, the book of Ezra uh, traditionally was a book that was combined with Nehemiah. So in our Bibles, when you look at the table of contents, you'll see that they're two separate books, but that's not how um, they were always read. And so I encourage you that if you have not read the book of Ezra yet, that you read it together with the book of Nehemiah to get a better understanding and context of what is going on. Uh, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and that's what I'll call it for the most part as we go through this Bible study. It's a book that um, covers the history of what is going on in the nation of Israel with the people of Israel after their exile. And so if you've been following us in our Bible study for this year, 2021, you know that at Damascus, our theme is the year of building and planting. And we are basing that on uh, the book of Jeremiah. And so in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah begins by telling the people in Judea, the, that's the people in the southern kingdom um, of Israel. He lets them know that your northern brothers and sisters have already been taken into Ez uh, exile. They've been taken by the Assyrians. And now God is not having happy with you because you are not honoring and following the covenant. And so he gives them a warning and he lets them know that if you continue to violate the covenant and you don't turn from your ways, God is going to honor the other part of his covenant, which is to bring correction. 
right? The correction might seem harsh to us when we read about it or think about it. But if you are a parent, you understand that sometimes there are certain things that you need to do to uh, show your children the consequences of their actions. And so this is one of those consequences. The consequence of violating the, co the covenant for the people of Israel was that God would basically remove his hand of protection from them. And so hold on one second. There seems to be a problem. Okay, we're back. I was just checking, making sure that we didn't lose that connection because my phone gave me a weird message. Okay, so where was I? So I was saying that uh, Jeremiah gave the people a warning and he told them that if you don't uh, honor the covenant, God is going to send a great and mighty nation that is going to come and take you into exile as well. So that great, great and mighty nation is the nation of Babylon, right? So the nation of Babylon comes in and they take the Israelites into captivity. And while they're in captivity, there's a lot of crazy things going on where the other prophets are trying to encourage the people basically by lying to them. They're telling them, oh, this is only going to last a short while. You're only going to be here for two years. And God says, no, that's not what it's about. It's about my word, right? My word is faithful. And I never said anything about two years. What I actually said is that you're going to be here for 70 years. And so if you turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 25, I'm going to read verse 8 and 11. And it says this. Therefore, this is what the Lord of heavenly forces says, because you haven't listened to my words, this whole country will be reduced to a wasteland and these nations will serve the, Bab the king of Babylon for 70 years. So that's Jeremiah speaking prophecy over the people in Judea, letting them know that you're going to go into captivity. And so the whole reason why I started with that is because this is now the end of the 70 years. Sometimes people think and the you know Israelites did the same thing they think God has abandoned them because things are taking too long and God was saying no it's not an issue of taking too long it's an issue of my time has not yet been met but now that my time has been met I am going to also do what I promised right and so in verse 12 of Jeremiah 25 it says when the 70 years are over I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation for their wrongdoing, declares the Lord. I will reduce the land of the Babylonians to a wasteland for all time. God goes on to say that when the 70 years is over, he will restore the nation of um, of Israel, the, the, the Judeans, and bring them back into Jerusalem. And so he lets them know that he is going to do it because he is a compassionate God. So turn with me to Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah is the chapter right before Malachi, so it's towards the end of the Old Testament. And so in chapter 1, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background of what's going on, but we're going to start at uh, verse 12. But before we get to verse 12, Looking at verse 7, Zechariah is a prophet and Zechariah has a vision. And in this vision, he sees a couple of things that are going on. He sees a man with a horse and a bunch of horses. And he also sees a messenger or an angel talking to him, right? And so he talks to the messenger and he asks the messenger what's going on. And the man answers and explains what's happening. Then he sees the messenger turn to the Lord and begin talking to the Lord. And the messenger says this to the Lord in verse 12. Then the Lord's messenger who was speaking with me said, Lord of heavenly forces, how long will you withhold compassion from Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, with whom you have been angry these 70 years? And the Lord responded to the messenger who was speaking with me with kind and compassionate words. The messenger speaking with me called out, This is what the Lord of heavenly forces says. I care passionately about Jerusalem and, Jude and Zion. And I am exceedingly angry with those carefree nations, though I was somewhat angry. They added to the violence. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I have returned to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, says the Lord of heavenly forces. Let a measuring line be stretched over Jerusalem. Call out again. The Lord of heavenly forces proclaims. My cities will again overflow with prosperity. The Lord will again show compassion to Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. And so this verse is important. Uh, this couple of verses are important because of how they relate to the book of Ezra. 
So the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, when you combine the two, has three waves of returnees that are coming back into Jerusalem, coming from exile. So the first wave happens during uh, the reign of King Cyrus of Persia. And so if you remember when we read Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12, where God promised that he would overthrow the Babylonians at the end of the 70 years, that is what has happened when Ezra begins, right? The king of Persia is uh, from a nation that has come in and has taken over Babylon. They've overthrown the king that was responsible for bringing the Israelites into uh, Babylon. And they have taken over that land, which means they have also taken over the inhabitants or the subjects of the land. And so now King Cyrus makes this declaration and he says to everybody, I'm sending you back home, right? But I'm sending you home with the understanding that I'm doing this because this is what the Lord has said to me, right? And that's significant when you consider the fact that in Isaiah chapter 44, at the end of 44, in the beginning of 45, you realize that. Cyrus, the king, was actually mentioned by name in Isaiah's prophecies. Isaiah prophesied that there is a time coming when God will anoint and appoint a servant who will do his bidding. And God specifically says, the one that I'm going to call is someone who doesn't even know me, yet he's going to do what I command him to do for the sake of Israel. And when he does this thing, everybody will see it and they will know that I alone am God, right? This is important because that is really the whole issue um, that God has with, with the people of Israel is they're not representing him and they're not showing everybody that he alone is God. They're living in a, a society where in Babylon they worship other gods and idols and now they have adopted those practices. But mind you, some of those practices, they came in with them, which is the reason why they are in exile. So instead of turning from their ways, they added to it, right? And so God calls this man who doesn't know anything about him. He's not a Jew. He's not a king that was raised in the, in the line of David or anything of that sort, right? And yet he hears the word of the Lord. And so you saw that in Ezra chapter 1, where it says that in verse 1, that the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus. And so all of this thing of the returning of the nation of, of, of Israel into Jerusalem is about God stirring it up. God is the one who is initiating it and he's doing it because it's part of his plan and it's part of his purpose. And so in the first wave of the returnees, that's being led by a man called Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is... Uh, from the line of the kings of, of David. He's uh, from the tribe of Judah. And that's important to know because that is another reminder of God's faithfulness and God's promise. Because if you remember when God spoke to David, he told him that there will always be someone from your lineage on the throne, right? So Zerubbabel comes back into Jerusalem with a crew of Judeans, right? And he comes in not as a king, Right. And the reason why he doesn't come in as a king is because Cyrus, with all of his, you know, arrogance, is the only king as far as he's concerned. And so what he does, though, is he appoints Zerubbabel as the governor over Jerusalem. The second wave of returnees takes place under a man called Ezra. Ezra is a priest and he is also a scribe. So Zerubbabel was responsible for the rebuilding of the altar and the rebuilding of the temple, while Ezra was responsible for the rebuilding of basically their, uh, their, their worship life in, in when you relate it to the understanding of scripture. So he was there to reestablish the Torah, to rebuild Torah as their foundation and to rebuild it as a way of life, right? And then the third wave happens under a man called Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was responsible for rebuilding the wall. And so going back to Zechariah chapter 1, the passages that we read, the reason why God speaks and gives this vision to Zechariah is because when Zerubbabel went to Jerusalem, they took a moment before they actually started rebuilding the temple. What they did was they, you know, built their houses first, which makes sense, right? If you think about it, you're coming into a land that has been totally devastated. It's been demolished. There's some remnants of houses. Maybe there might be houses that are, you know, fully 
functioning and stuff but they're abandoned so you have to you know clean up you have to remodel you have to repaint you have to repair stuff right and so you need somewhere to live because it's hard to work when you don't have a roof over your own head so they take a, about seven months you know to get everybody settled so everybody gets settled in their households and everything is going well and then he calls another gathering where he says to everybody let's not forget what we came here for we came here to rebuild the altar and the temple so as they're going through this process of rebuilding the altar and the temple, there's a group of people um, in my translation of the Bible, Common English Bible, it calls them the neighboring people. The neighboring people approach uh, Zerubbabel, and we can turn to that, and that's in chapter 4. And it says, in, I'll read verse 1 and 2. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 in Ezra, it says, When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the families and said to them, Let's build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we've been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Assyria's king, Asaradon, who brought us here. And in verse 3, it says, But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families in Israel replied, You'll have no part with us in building a house for our God. We alone will build because the Lord, the God of Israel, and Persia's King Cyrus commanded us. Right? And so, instead of inviting these people to participate, Zerubbabel pretty much gets mad and he says there is absolutely no way that you can participate in it. Now there's a number of reasons why uh, people say that Zerubbabel rejected this offer, right? So if you remember anything about the nation of Israel, the northern nation, the northern kingdom, when they were taken into exile under the Assyrians, they were they were taken away and their land was left with just a remnant of people. And so the king of Assyria didn't want to leave it, you know, completely empty because when you leave a place empty, that's when you get wild animals and stuff coming in and harassing the people. And so what he did was he took other captives that he had captured from other conquered nations and he brought them in to uh, into the northern kingdom. And so that place where he brought them is called Samaria. So these people that the book of Ezra is talking about, referring to as the neighboring people, it's the Samaritans, right? So the Samaritans, as I said, are people who are coming from other nations that are being brought in. And so when they arrive in Jerusalem, there's with the remnant, the remnant, you know, uh, asks the king of Assyria to send them a priest who can teach them and train them in the Torah because they're trying to correct the error of their ways. So this priest doesn't limit his teaching just to the remnant of Israelites that is that are there. He extends it to this new group of people who have come in. And so he teaches them about Jehovah. But in his teaching them about Jehovah, they grabbed hold of what he said, but they didn't uh, shun what they had come in with. So they practice a mixed religion where they worship Jehovah and something else, right? And that something else is typically Baal plus possibly some other gods as well. And so one um, idea is that the reason why Zerubbabel rejected their help is because think about this. You know that you and your people were sent into exile because you violated God's covenant. And part of violating God's covenant meant that you were worshiping Jehovah and something else, right? So you went into exile because of it. You suffered in that exile. And now God says, come on back. When he says, come out of time out, your thought process is probably saying to you, what can we do to make sure that we don't end up in this predicament again? And so in order to make sure you don't end up in that predicament again, one of the things that you might do is you might set up a strict structure in terms of who we can interact with. And one of the people we will avoid interacting with is anybody who does what we used to do, right? So the Samaritans fall into that category of people who do what we used to do, so we don't want to have anything to do with them. There's another idea that the reason why uh, Zerubbabel and his crew refused to accept help from the Samaritans is because if you understand anything about um, building communities and things like that, right? When you receive resources from other organizations outside of the church, there is always a concern of what are they going to ask for after we're done, 
right? And so there was a concern that if they partnered with the Samaritans in this building project and took the resources that the Samaritans were, asked, were offering, that after the temple was built, that the Samaritans might come to them and say, hey, we understand that you guys use the temple predominantly, you know, on, you know, Friday, Saturday over the Sabbath, but is it okay if we use it on Wednesday nights so that we can be able to do our bail practices or whatever it is that they're doing? And so when you think Think about it from that context it makes sense that Zerubbabel and his and his buddies refused you know the help of the Samaritans but I want to challenge you uh, by saying is that the right thing that they should have done and when I say is that the right thing that they should have done I'm talking about it from the context of what were they basing their decision on were they basing it on something God had said, which when you read through the text of Ezra chapters 1 through 4, when it gets to the point where they rejected this help, it doesn't say anything about God telling them to refuse the help, right? And so the question again is, was this what they should have done? And so when they refused the help, again, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the people that we're talking about. Um, there's a difference between feeling and practice, right? So because we are all people of God, I am assuming that maybe if you feel this way, you don't necessarily practice it, right? So I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So let's look at feelings. How would you feel if you offered somebody help? And the reason why you offered it to them is because you are excited about what they're doing. And the person says to you, oh, hail to the no, you can't have any part of it. You're probably not going to take that the right way. You're not going to receive it and say, oh, okay, I offered. Let me just go about my business. You're probably going to be a bit salty about it, right? And so that's what I suspect is what was going on when the Samaritans heard this. They were like, oh, you're going to reject us? You know what I mean? Just because you think that you're better than us? And so now the difference between what I said before about feeling and, and practice is they didn't stop at feeling. They went forward with the practice and they said, since you won't let us be part of the building of the temple, no one will be part of building the temple. And so they ended up writing letters to the king, not to King Cyrus, but to the new king that was now over Persia. And they complained and they made it sound like the Jewish people were viola violating a political or governmental structure, right? And so you know how it is. You say anything negative about the government in some countries, the government is all over you, right? And so that's pretty much what happened. They presented it and said that the Jews are saying negative things and they're doing this for negative reasons. They're trying to overthrow your power and your government. So the king panicked and he said, well, then if that's what they're doing, put a stop to it. And so the, the temple building was put on hold. And so that's where now the, the text of Zechariah comes in because it's been about maybe 20, 21 years since they started building the temple, right? And so about 21 years have passed and the temple is still not, is not uh, complete. And so God sends Zechariah to say to the people of Judea, remember what I said, remember who I am, remember that my word is faithful, remember that I am faithful, and remember that if I say something is going to happen, you need to operate and act on that understanding and belief that what I have said is going to happen is going to happen. So I declared that my temple will be rebuilt, I declared that I will inhabit my sanctuary, and I declared that I will uh, rest and rule, I mean, rest and abide in Jerusalem. All these things will happen if you will only hold on to my truth and hold on to my word. So Ze Zechariah encouraged encourages them and tells them that they need to continue with the rebuilding, right? Let's go on to, um, let me see where we are. Just scanning my notes. Give me one second here. So I talked about God's faithfulness and I talked about how God is setting things up for them to basically connect with his faithfulness right and so I want to point out a couple of things and so if you if you understand anything about um, Old Testament you know that the way that the Hebrew people describe God is usually and most of the time connected to what he did when he delivered the people from Egypt right so they always refer to him as the deliverer they refer to him as the one who brought our people out of Egypt they refer to him as the one who uh, provided for us in the wilderness the one who brought us into the into the promised land so this is the image that they have of God 
right? And so they use that as an anchoring point to be able to say, God, because of who you are and who, who you were back then, then this is why I trust you in the place that I am right now. Okay. And so, um, if you go back to Ezra chapter, chapter one, I want you to look at um, a verse we already read, and it is verse 6, right? Actually, verse 5 and 6. I'm not going to read it again. But God already stirred up the, the people of Judea, and he stirred them up so that they have this heart and this desire to go back to Jerusalem as he has commanded. And they ask their neighbors for resources, right? And when you see that and you see how much they were given, like if you read that long list of things that they were given, it's supposed to trigger something for you. It's supposed to trigger, wait, what does this remind us of? And it reminds us of when God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt. When he brought them out of Egypt, God said to them, said to Moses, command the people to ask the Egyptians for resources as they're leaving. And if you remember that when they left, if you turn to Exodus chapter 12, verse 35 and 36, it says the Israelites did as Moses had told them and asked the Egyptians for their silver and gold jewelry, as well as their clothing. The Lord made sure that the Egyptians were kind to the people so that they let them have whatever they asked for. And so they robbed the Egyptians. And so this incidence that you see in Ezra as they're leaving Babylon, it's similar in the sense of they're leaving with a bunch of resources. The only difference is it's not so much a robbery per se, because the people who are giving are not only the Babylonians, it's also uh, their kinsmen who have chosen to stay. But they're getting all these resources from everywhere and the resources that they're receiving are resources for rebuilding uh, the temple. And so... Um, the idea of this abundance of resources is also supposed to trigger a, another reminder. It's supposed to trigger a reminder that where God's abundance of re and resources are, it's evidence of God's presence. Now, I want to uh, clarify this. When you look at your life or the lives of people that you know and you don't see abundance in their life, don't judge them and say, oh, that means that God is not present. No, this idea that I'm talking about is specific to the people of Israel. It is something that God specifically said. He said, I will do this so that people will see that I am with you, right? And it always ties back to the mission of the, the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was always intended to be a light that draws other nations to God, right? And so because God had given this, them this specific goal and this specific work to do, he poured certain things into them that you might not necessarily see in your own life, right? So again, like I said, don't judge yourself, don't judge other people. There's a reason why they lived in abundance. Their abundance was connected to what God had promised. So turn to the book of Joel, um, and we're going to look at Joel chapter 2. And again, Joel is in the Old Testament. It comes right after Job. I almost asked somebody to read it and I had to remember I'm in this room by myself. <laughs> All right. But I wish you were here with me because if you were, then I would be asking you to read it for me. So in Joel chapter two, if you start at the beginning of chapter two, you'll see that God talks about um, this great and mighty nation. The mighty nation that he's talking about is the nation of Babylon. And God talks about and describes their power, their might, and their majesty, and how they come in with such a great force and great power. And they basically devastate everything that they come in contact with. And then he uh, gets to uh, verse 25, and I'll read that for you. He says, I will repay you for the years that the cutting locust, the swarming locust, the hopping lo locust, and the devouring locust have eaten my great army, which I sent against you. 26, you will eat abundantly and be satisfied, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has done wonders for you, and my people will never again be put to shame. 
So these two verses are, again, like I said, a reminder of God's faithfulness and of God's promise. And so God says the, that the nation of Babylon is going to come in and they're going to devour everything similar to the way a swarm of locusts devours anything. Now, this is something that I looked up. And if you know anything about a swarm of locusts, a swarm of locusts is up to like, I think it's something like up to 50 billion locusts. And one of the greatest uh sizes of, of a swarm that has been recorded was about 25 miles, right? And I can't remember the, the, the width of that, but that's t letting you know how many locusts there were in, in that particular swarm. And when a swarm of locusts comes in and they sit, they're the kind of, of, of insects that eat anything and everything. Like if you know about goats, goats eat anything and everything. There isn't anything that they don't eat. Locusts are the same. So when they eat a plant, they eat the leaves, they eat the grain, they eat the stock, they eat everything and they leave very little. And so after they land and finish eating and fly away, they can have devoured about 80% of your crop. And if you want an idea of how much food that is, there's an article that I read that said a swarm of locusts can eat the equivalent of the amount of food that every single person in New York and California combined would eat in a day. So that gives you an idea of how much food they can eat. So that's the level of devastation that a, a swarm of locusts can cause. And God is, is using that metaphor to paint the picture of the level of devastation that the Babylonians caused. And so if you think about it, you're looking at your land, you're looking at Jerusalem and you're saying, wow, that's how devastated things are. But my God promises that he is going to restore everything that has been taken, right? And not just the 80% 80, 80 that was taken, he's going to add to it. He says, you will eat abundantly and be satisfied, right? And so again, it's a reminder that when you see that happen, that is a reminder that I am present and that I'm with you. So you're probably wondering, why are you jumping all over the place, Reverend Chipo? What is the significance of all of this to the book of Ezra? Don't forget what I said about what happened in Ezra where they asked for resources and they were given. And it was meant to connect them to uh, Exodus. It's also meant to connect them to all of the other prophetic words that they have heard along the way. Right. And so some of you might be saying the same thing that some of the Israelites might have been saying as well, which is, well, he didn't say it directly to us when he was talking to the prophets. He said it to our forefathers. But if you understand that they lived in an oral tradition with an oral tradition, that means that what the forefathers knew had been passed down. So the grandkids and the great grandkids are not exempt from the knowing. They know all of these promises because it was told to them. And it was passed down. So they know the things that God promised when he spoke through Jeremiah. They know what was promised when he spoke through Isaiah. They know what was promised when he spoke through Joel. Right. And so they know that God has said, I will bring you back. I will restore you. I will rebuild. Right. Not just my temple, but also the city. And when I do it, you will know that I am present because you will have abundance. So here they are with this abundance. It's supposed to say, OK, God is with us. Right. So then let's move on to um, Ezra chapter 2, right? This is another thing that is meant to trigger their, memory, their memory about God being the God who delivers and the God who is faithful. In Ezra chapter 2, in verses 68 and 69, it talks about a free will offering that was given. Right. And so this free will offering was given by that first wave of Judeans, the first wave of returnees. As they came in, they gave what they wanted to give. Right. And that's that, that's the thing with the free will offering. It's not an offering where God commands how much you should give. He basically says give and he tells you what you're giving for. And then you give because of your excitement and your joy. Right. And so when you see them doing this in uh Ezra chapter 2, verses 68 to 69, it's supposed to remind you of that incident that happened when God had told them to build a tabernacle, right? So here they are in Judea, they're building the temple. But before the temple, they had a tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent that they could take, uh, take apart because they were wanderers, they were travelers, but it still served the same purpose. It was a place where God resided and they knew that God was present in that place and they came and they worshiped him there. And so in Exodus chapter 35, 
Moses is given a command by God and he tells everybody, hey, this is what the Lord has said. The Lord wants us to build the tabernacle. And when Moses says this, he says, God says, bring offerings, bring free will offerings to your heart's desire, your heart's content. So whatever you're able to give, whatever you want to give, bring that. And so when they heard Moses speak, it says in Exodus 35, 21, that the people left with great excitement and they were eager to participate and they were so eager to participate that they brought everything literally everything that you can think of that is needed for building this tabernacle right and those who didn't have a lot of resources they brought what they have so it even talks about people bringing uh like little pins that are needed for you know tacking stuff and then and the nails you have people bringing thread you have people bringing jewelry that can be melted so that they can use that that precious metal to be able to make the finishings that god had 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 uh prescribed in the architecture of the temple of the tabernacle and so in all of this giving because of their excitement and their joy you later see where the builders the ones who are working on the on the tabernacle they end up going to moses i think it says one by one each and every one of them went to him and i don't know if they went one by one because they hadn't talked to each other about going to talk to him or if it was because it just took moses that long to hear what they were saying it doesn't really matter why they did it but the point is every single one of them went to moses and they said the exact same thing they said to him please moses can you tell the people to stop bringing resources because they're bringing too much their excitement is overwhelming us we have too much we don't know what to do with it right and so that's exciting when you think about being that that uh, excited about the work that God is doing that you give more than what God requires isn't that an amazing thing and so that's what's happening um, in that situation and so when they see this happening here where they're giving and giving it's supposed to trigger again that joy that excitement of being in the presence of the Lord so again, I'm just, I, I keep repeating this and the reason I keep repeating this is because it's foundational. It's important to understand not just what's going on in Ezra, but even to understand how you can be unhindered and how you can be unafraid, right? Being unhindered and unafraid is connected to your understanding of who God is, but it is also connected to uh, the word and the promise that you hold on to. So those of you who are members of Damascus who had the opportunity to get the um, Bible study notes via email, I'm just going to read a couple of questions for you to think about, right, as we go through the rest of this lesson. So question number one to think about, and here's something that you can do. I see some of you are on Facebook and you're uh, writing a couple of comments. If you want to answer it in the comments, that would be great. You know, if I have time, I'll try to read some of your responses. If not, bless each other, you know, by, by talking to each other about this. And so here's the, question, the first question to consider. Uh, Damascus is getting ready to resume in-person worship service. And when we resume, we're going to resume in the second week of July. And that's a plug for anyone who lives in the Seattle area who hasn't been to Damascus yet or hasn't been to Damascus in a long time. We would love to see you. And so we open up again on July the 11th. All right. And so question number one, as we prepare to regather as a Damascus family, what word of God's faithfulness are you holding on to? Right. The word that I keep on bringing up for the, the people of Judea is that God is present. Right. And God is faithful. What word are you holding on to? What are you afraid of? And is your fear warranted? Does God stand greater and more powerful than the things that terrify you? And if not, why not? And the last question, what wisdom has God given you to keep you from being and feeling restricted and constrained right so those are the three questions to think about as we go through the rest of this lesson right so let's go back to this idea of the word um, enemy or adversary right so if you look up the the Hebrew word for enemy and adversary it translates um, like this it, it translates into the into the word hindering but it's not really just a word it's more of a concept. And so it paints the picture of someone or something causing distress by restricting or making the space tight or narrow. 
So when you think of an enemy or an adversary, they're constraining your movement and your activity. And so remember in Ezra chapter four, that's what the, the neighboring people did, right? When they got upset and mad that they weren't allowed to participate, they wrote letters to the king and they basically restricted the movement of the Judeans. They monitored everything that they were doing to make sure that they didn't rebuild the temple, right? And so they were hindered. And they were they felt like they were being squished. If you know a boa constrictor, what a boa constrictor does, the way that it kills you is it wraps around your chest. And every time you exhale, it squeezes a little tighter. So you breathe in when you exhale, it squeezes a little tighter until it suffocates you. And so it's that idea that the enemy, the adversary is hindering you, constricting you, making the space tight and narrow like that so that you can't breathe until you suffocate and die. Right. And then um, I want to take you to Ezra chapter 3. And in Ezra chapter 3, this is where I told you they started to rebuild the, te the, the temple. But before they rebuilt the temple, they relayed the foundation for the altar to rebuild the altar. And so I told you they did this seven months after they had been there. And then it goes on to Ezra chapter 3 verse 3. Now, there are some translations that will say that even though they were afraid, they rebuilt the temple, right? But there's also a number of translations that say this, and I'm reading again from the Common English Bible. It says, they, meaning the, the people of Judea, set up the altar on its foundations because they were afraid of the neighboring peoples, and they offered entirely burned offerings upon it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening offerings, right? And so... The reason why I brought that up is because of that word because, right? When we started this, we talked about God's faithfulness and we talked about it connected to his promises, connected to his word. And we talked about the book of Ezra, Nehemiah being, it's, it's like it's encamped and, and circled by prophetic word, right? So that is what they're supposed to be looking at. That is what they're supposed to be focused on. But instead of looking at that, the fear came from the size and numbers that they had and the size and numbers of all the people that were surrounding them. When you look at Ezra chapter 2, you'll see there's a long list of names, a long list of people, and a bunch of numbers that give you an idea of how many people came in that first wave, right? And when you read it, it seems like a lot of people. But when you do more research, you find out that the number of people who responded to God's call when God said, go back to Jerusalem, it was actually very small compared to the number of people who said, you know, Lord, I hear what you're saying, but my contribution is going to be through me giving resources while I just stay here in the land of exile. And what is the reason why people would choose to stay in the land of exile? If you think about it, you've been there, your family, even though maybe you as an individual have not been there for 70 years, your family has been there for 70 years. And over this time, they have built stuff. They are prospering, especially if they are following what Jeremiah had said in uh, Jeremiah 20, I believe it's Jeremiah 29, where he told them to build and to plant and to, you know, to, to have weddings and grow your family and live life because as you prosper, the place where you are will prosper. And so if you've been doing this, Imagine leaving your house. So you've you've uh, risen, you know, in the ranks of the community in Babylon. Um, maybe when you came in, you felt like, oh, we came in with nothing because we were stripped away from from our land. We were stripped away from our possessions and our culture. But we've had the opportunity to grow and to thrive. And now you want me to go back to this place where I have nothing. Basically, I'm supposed to leave my mansion and go live a camping lifestyle, you know, while I'm waiting to rebuild my house. For some people, that might not be the best idea. And so they might be thinking, yeah, nah, it's not me. I'm not the one. So there were a bunch of, of, of um, people of Jewish heritage who said, no, I'm not going back. And maybe there were some who said, I will go, but I'm not going back in the first wave. You know, let me wait for you guys to get something started uh, before I go. So the group that is there with Zerubbabel, it's a small group compared to the nations and the, the people that are surrounding them. There's also another issue that might be invoking fear, right? If you think about it, you just walked back into Jerusalem. You walked into a place that other people are living in, right? And you're walking in with the claim 
that this is your land. This is your house. This belongs to your people. You know, the, the Bible doesn't necessarily say in the book of Ezra whether or not the neighboring people treated them negatively. But when you think about human nature, it's very likely that they did. You know what I mean? How many of you would be happy? Let's say the house you're living in belonged to somebody else that got evicted. Right. And you have been living there for a long time, you know, and all of a sudden the old or original family shows up at your door talking about how uh, we're taking the master bedroom. You know what I mean? You're probably not going to be happy about that. And so there's going to be tension, even if you maybe don't necessarily show it with any verbal or physical violence. There's still tension. Everybody knows you're not really friends. Right. And so because of this. The, the Judeans who had returned had a, a, a sense of fear, you know, of, of the people who were there, right? And so it sounds like that fear that they had is justified, right? Because I just gave you reason and example, you know, why they could possibly be afraid. But when you go back to remembering what God has been saying to them and you remember that God has been promising that this work that you're doing is going to happen. This work that you're doing is being stirred by me. I am the one initiating it. I am the one who is making it happen. Then it's supposed to make you ask the question, well, should we be afraid? Right. Even though this group of people is larger than us and has more than we have, do we need to be afraid knowing who our God is? Right. And there's something I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to miss what uh, the book of Ezra calls God right at the beginning. Um, and remember who's saying it. This is Cyrus, someone who does not worship Jehovah as the only God. And yet he calls God the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is a term that describes God's holiness and his power. Right. He is a Lord, not just of one army. You know, he is the commander of chief commander in chief of a multitude of armies. So that means at his command, he has this military army that can come in, you know, in any moment and fight on your behalf. Right. And again, remember that I keep on saying that the stuff that is happening in the book of Ezra is meant to point them to the stuff that has happened for their forefathers. Right. And so if you remember when the nation of Israel entered into the promised land, right, when they entered into the promised land, there were multiple nations that were greater than them that they encountered. Right. And they had to fight against them. But if you look through their history, you see the number of wars and battles that they won simply by obeying God's word. Right. By trusting in God, following what God said, they were able to win. Sometimes they had to physically fight. Sometimes they just had to sit back in obedience and God did it. Right. And so the idea is it doesn't matter how he's going to do it. You walk into the situation knowing that he is going to do it. So it doesn't matter how big or bad your enemy is. You shouldn't feel afraid. Right. Because you know who your God is. And so there's uh, another passage. Let me see if I can find it. That talks where God is talking about the fear that the other nations are supposed to experience and that fear that they're supposed to experience is actually connected to what God is doing. Let me see if I can find it for you. Give me one second. Okay, let's go to Exodus chapter 15. And in Exodus chapter 15, uh, beginning at verse 13, it says, With your great loyalty, you led the people you rescued. With your power, you guided them to your sanctuary. The peoples heard. They shook in terror. Horror grabbed hold of Philistia's inhabitants. And that word in verse 14 uh, that talks about terror, it's the same word that we see here in Ezra chapter 3, verse 3. Right. So the nation of Israel is the one trembling in terror, but they're not supposed to. They're supposed to remember that their God who brought and delivered their ancestors out of Israel is the God who invokes who invokes terror in everybody else. And the reason why everybody else, like in verse 15 in Exodus. So again, we're Exodus chapter 15, verse 15. 
It says, then Edom's tribal chiefs were terrified. Panic grabbed hold of Moab's rulers. All of Canaan's inhabitants melted in fear. And so if you remember the story of, um, let me get her name right, Rahab. I believe it's Rahab, right? Uh, who was in Jericho. She said to the spies that were sent by Moses. So Moses sent some spies into Jericho and they encountered this lady. And she said to them, we have heard what your God has done, right? And so because they have heard, some of them haven't even seen it, they've just heard what he has done. They said, we are trembling in fear. And so you're supposed to have that idea that the, these Samaritans are possibly also saying the same thing. We have heard what your God has done. We have heard that your God promised that he would bring you out of captivity after 70 years. And now we have seen him do it. We are, we are witnesses to him doing this wonderful and faithful thing that he promised, right? And so if, if people know and see what God has done, there's absolutely no reason for you to be afraid. And so I have some um, more things that I want to challenge you on um, in the last couple of minutes here. Let me see. And so think about this again. I'm going to repeat this again, that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is set in the context of prophecy, right? So while King Cyrus was not a Jew, who worshiped Jehovah as the only God. The prophet Isaiah prophesied about him. We talked about that earlier. God called him a servant and chose and anointed him for the sake of the people of Israel to ensure that God's word and promise would be fulfilled. That's the first thing that you should remember, right? So God is faithful to his word. Joel, we read this, prophesied that God's presence would be made known in Jerusalem and among his people when they witnessed an abundance of resources pouring into the once desolate city right? God gives evidence of his presence. There is a limit to how much you can carry when you leave a place, right? And so if God is who he says he is, then that same God has other ways of pouring into you when you cannot carry anything else. And so I ask you this question. When the, the Samaritans approach Zerubbabel and they ask the question, can we participate, right? Could it be possible that these neighboring people that Zerubbabel rejected were supposed to bring more resources and offerings to the temple. Could it be possible that this was another way God was using to pour abundance into this work to show that his, his presence was there, right? Another thing to think about, the prophet Joel also said that God would pour out his spirit on all people, including the male and female slaves or servants. So depending on the translation of Bible you're reading, it'll say either the word slave or servant. The people of God, that's the, the, the Israelites, were forbidden from holding one another in slavery. So when you hear the term servant or slave in this context, basically you're reading about uh, foreigners or Gentiles. So God is saying, I will pour my spirit out on you. And we saw that in Ezra chapter one, where it says that their spirit was stirred, right? The spirit of the Judeans who came back in the first wave. But then you also see God pouring out his spirit on foreigners. Cyrus is an example of those foreigners. My question is, could it be possible that when the Samaritans came and said, can we help you, that God had also stirred them up, right? Is it possible that, that Cyrus was not the only one that God was speaking to, right? Um, it says in Isaiah chapter 14, and this is in verse 1, it says, The Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will give them rest in, the, in their own land. These words echo what the prophet Zechariah said in Zechariah chapter one, right? And then Isaiah goes on to say, immigrants will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. So could it be possible that when the neighboring people approached Zerubbabel and the other leaders saying, let us build with you for we worship your God as you do, that this was their attempt at attaching themselves to the house of Jacob? And then the last thing to remember is this, that um, in the book of Isaiah, God promised that when the people of Israel were returned to Jerusalem, that they would be a light that draws other nations to God through God's faithfulness. 
So in Isaiah chapter 2, I'm going to read for you verses 1 through 5. It says this. This is what Isaiah, Amos's son, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted up above the hills. Peoples will stream to it. And so where they're building the temple, that is on a mount, right? So that's where when you read in the Psalms about the, uh, the, the Psalms of Ascension, it's because they had to climb up the mountain. But then when they get to a certain place, they also have to climb up the stairs that lead to the temple, right? And so God has has chosen this place on this mountain as his place of worship and he says in Isaiah that there's a day coming when the Lord's house will be on that mountain and it'll be lifted above the, the hills and people will stream to it. Verse 3 says many nations will go and say come let's go up to the Lord's mountain to the house of Jacob's God so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in God's paths. Right. I told you that the Samaritans are a mixture of people. They are multicultural people that came from different nations. Right. So they could be representing these very nations that God is talking about when he says that they will be drawn. Right. And then it goes on to say instruction will come from Zion. That is the place where God lives, the place of the temple to the Lord's. Uh, the Lord's word will come from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of mighty nations. Then they will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. That means there won't be strife. There won't be, you know, wars, right? Nation will take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light, right? So my challenge is this. Could it be possible that when Zerubbabel and the other leaders re rejected the Samaritans, that they were not viewing their assignment in the context of this prophetic word from God, right? Because if they had viewed it in the context of the prophetic word, then they would have seen the Samaritans as representatives of these other nations, and they would have seen this as an opportunity to teach them. Because don't miss this part. When the Samaritans spoke to them, they said, we worship the same God as you. This is back in Ezra chapter four in verse two. And it says, for we worship your God as you do. And we've been sacrificing to him ever since the days of a serious king, Aseradon, who brought us here. Right. They said, we worship him as you do. But they didn't. They didn't worship him the way that that the Jewish people did. But because they were open to it. That means there's room to teach them. There's room to teach them the correct things that the priest who had taught them initially failed to do. There's room to to elevate them to the next level of worship. Right. Simply by connecting everything that is going on with what God has said in the past and then connecting it with what God is saying their assignment is. And so as they're building alongside of each other, that could have been opportunity for them to be that light and to be that witness. Right. But because they were operating in fear, which we saw in chapter three, they didn't see these people as people that need to be ministered to. They saw them as people that we need to guard ourselves against. Right. And so God gives wisdom. Right. And instruction to his people and expects them to teach and share that wisdom to others. That's what this text in Isaiah that we just read is talking about. It says that wisdom and instruction will come from Zion, meaning that God will give his word to his people and his people are supposed to pass that word on to everybody else. Right. And so it's hard for you to teach somebody about God when you're afraid of them. Right. I want to take you to Proverbs chapter four. And in Proverbs chapter four, verses one through ten, um, assuming that Proverbs was written by King Solomon, this is Solomon talking to his son. And so he talks to his son about wisdom. He describes wisdom. He talks about the benefit of it. And he says to his son a couple of times, get wisdom, get understanding. Right. Because your life will be better when you have wisdom. And so in verse 11, he goes on to say that wisdom will direct your path. It'll direct your way. It'll lead you and it'll guide you. And then in verse 12, it says this. When you walk, you won't be hindered. When you run, you won't stumble. And that word hindered is the same word that we read in Ezra chapter four, where it called the Samaritans enemies. Remember, we said that enemy means hindered, right? So God is saying that when you walk in wisdom, 
you won't be hindered. So all that stuff that restrains you and constrains you, it's not that it's not going to come, but it's not going to have the same impact on you because you're following God's word. God's word is wisdom. And so that's why I asked you that question at the beginning. What word of God's faithfulness are you holding on to? Because that word that you're holding on to, that needs to be the wisdom that you operate in when we move forward into what I call the new, new normal, right? Because when the pandemic hit, we had to shift into a new normal. Now things are being lifted, restrictions are being lifted, you know, recommendations are changing. What is the new, new normal going to look like? For some people, it might cause anxiety. It might cause panic, right? Maybe because you're somebody who, you know, you haven't been going outside a lot. Uh, maybe you're somebody who, you know, you have panic attacks when you wear a mask. Uh, maybe you have panic attacks when someone approaches you to offer you a handshake or something, right? Because we haven't had, we haven't, you know, shook hands in over a year and now people are shaking hands or trying to shake hands i don't know how you're reacting or how you're responding to all these new things right but what wisdom are you holding on to because remember what you do it's about being a light so god is calling us to be a light he's calling us to be a witness but it's hard for you to do that if you're operating in fear and so that is all that i have for you today um, I want to thank all of you for joining us. I'm just going to scan through the comments real quick to see if anybody asked a question before I say goodbye. All right. And I don't see any questions. And so that is all I have. And so I bid you all a wonderful evening. And I pray that this Bible study has been a blessing to you. And I pray that there's something that you heard today that will help you to be able to um, make decisions as we move forward. Um, just a reminder again, Damascus is reopening for in-person worship services on the second Sunday in July. So that is July the 11th. And we are going to be moving once we reopen back to our 1030 worship time in the morning. And so we invite you all to join us. If you're not able to join us in person, we invite you to join us online because we will, go we will continue doing our worship services virtually. And so I just say thank you again and God bless you. Bye-bye.